I'm Dustin Kirkland here at KubeCon in Copenhagen, Denmark, and I'm joined by Tim Hawken, who's going to give us his thoughts on a handful of the questions that you've been asking us this week. Tim, you've been around Kubernetes a long time. I'm, I'd really like to hear from you in your words how Kubernetes is changing the course of application development and ultimately IT operations at scale. Sure. Uh, I think Kubernetes uh, containers and the sort of orchestration model uh, is really changing the way people are able to think about their applications, the way they think about uh, building them and the way they think about running them. Um, in terms of building, Kubernetes really captures the microservices model where you can build lots of small pieces and link them together into a larger application. Um, from the operations point of view, from the IT side, it lets you think about uh, your applications and your code in a way that isn't so one-to-one. Uh, -one. You don't think about which machine is running which piece of software, and you don't think about how you handle um, events and sorts of things that go wrong. And why uh, is that important? It's important because things go wrong all the time, <laughs> right? I mean, everybody who's run an application understands the reality. Things crash, and they always crash at 2 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday uh, when you are on vacation, hmm. right? Um, after a night of drinking. Right. And but with Kubernetes, that doesn't happen. No, it's things still crash. <laughs> right. But Kubernetes is designed to accept the reality that things will crash, and we will just move it somewhere else because the the identity of the machine that you're running on is not that important. Mm. Right. Your application is just a unit that we can move across the soup of your cluster, and we can just bring it up somewhere else. We can let the system self heal. And if it takes a little while for that crash machine to come back online, maybe maybe it takes a week. Maybe you have to buy a new hard drive. That's fine because you shifted the load somewhere else. Uh, and once people start to internalize that idea, it changes fundamentally the way you think about running your applications in the cluster. This is how we've been doing it at Google more or less forever. Um, the idea of uh, a machine, a VM or a physical machine, a server that runs my application and just my application is completely foreign to the sort of Google mindset of how you build an application. Mm. You throw it into the, the Borg and it runs somewhere. And so Kubernetes tries to bring sort of the best of that uh, to the open source world. So Tim, you've been around this technology for a long time. You've seen the evolution of Borg at Google in, in, in its early inception and its migration into Kubernetes. How did, how did Google developers make that transition to writing for Borg and how does that translate to third party developers writing for a Kubernetes that maybe has nothing to do with, with they're quite detached from the Kubernetes that's ultimately going to run their application. So, you know, with, with Google and Googlers, it, it was back in 2003-ish when Borg started to come into fruition. And it really a very different system than, than it is now. Uh, but the ideas were the same. Take a machine, share it across multiple users, put some isolation barriers in place so that you can provide some level of guarantee that you won't hurt each other, hmm. um, that you can coexist. And uh, it took a long time for people to sort of give up the private machine mentality, um, especially for these big applications like Search where, you know, Google really makes its money, uh, these were very difficult. Um, they have very strong requirements in terms of performance and guarantees. And so it took a long time for those apps to sort of come into the Borg ecosystem. But once they did, their lives are, are better for it, right? And they, we, they get the consistent operations, the consistent tooling. Um, you know, we have a very small cluster, uh, sorry, very small team of cluster administrators who run the entire Google fleet. And it's amazing wow. because the power of Borg lets them scale that way. So. For people outside uh, Google, people who are in the, the, the real world, um, they look at Kubernetes and they see it sort of as this new thing. They don't really know what to make of it. Um, it's natural that people have some amount of reluctance sure. to get into it. Um, but the more we show people, the, the better off they'll be. I had a, a great personal moment when I was presenting at uh, Usenix Lisa a couple of years ago, right. room full of systems and Fantastic administrators, right? Yeah. And, uh, and I showed them some of what Kubernetes can do. Just here's how you do a rolling update. Here's how you do a deployment. Here's how you flip a service from A to B. And there were audible gasps in the room. People, it, how did you do that? Um, and that was great for me because it's like this is this is the mindset. I've seen that too. The developers who who come around and come to understand how much Kubernetes does for them, so that they can focus on simply their application packages as a, as a container and see yep. that that scaled out. I think it helps take. You, you mentioned it helps take in a small IT team and turn it you know functional at larger scale, even yeah. smaller. But it also helps one developer, a team of developers, uh, create. Quite a bit, quite a bit more technology. For sure, you don't need to have a huge operations team to run a big fleet, and uh, I think you can get away with a very small ops team uh, if you've got a small fleet. You know, uh, yeah. you've got a, if you've got a hundred nodes in your fleet, which is a pretty decent sized compute fleet, right? You can run a pretty big website on a hundred machines. You can really run that with one or two people. Yeah. 
So you've, you've seen Google effectively democratize that technology and make that generally available to practically anyone. Absolutely. I mean, a, a big part of Kubernetes was us bringing these ideas forward, but not just the ideas on their own, like in a working implementation. We, it was really important for us to say, not only do we believe you should operate like this, but we're going to help you do this. Right. All right. Now, you've got a position in the community that enables you to see a lot of the different hard technical problems um, around Kubernetes. Can you give us a sense of where some of the some of the areas are that need the most work? And I'm talking less code writing and more like design decisions, some of the big hard problems. Sure. Um, you know, Kubernetes is a big project. It's got a lot of surface area. Um, one of the big problems we have is how to uh, limit the growth of that surface area. We can't grow forever. Um, and so uh, a ton of work has been going into things like extension mechanisms and plugins and, and hooks and um, making those things really truly usable for production grade deployments, not just prototypes. Um, and so a, a ton of work has been going in, a ton more work has to be done. Um, and is being done now, the community is uh, amazing and very vibrant here. Um, so this is one that I think is really interesting. Um, another is in the growth of the surface area, um, you see a lot of new challenges that were not in scope when we started. Mm. Um, you know, I work in the infrastructure side of things, so networking and storage. So one example here is Kubernetes growing to fill uh, more networking spaces, things right. that have traditionally been filled by classical uh, virtualized networking, NFVs and, and virtual firewalls and deep packet inspection and all those sorts of things that a lot of enterprises, a lot of big companies have done, have been have been sold, um, that they believe in the technology, the, the value that it brings to their company. How do you map that to Kubernetes? Yeah. Um, and you know, This is a place where Kubernetes has to plug into the way the enterprise already operates. It can't just wipe the slate clean and start. Some of it, some of that, and some of it is really looking at the problem with fresh eyes and coming back to it and saying, how, what would be the Kubernetes way of describing this problem, right? Yeah. Um, so there's going to be some blending there. These are problems that Google never had, right? This is a place where Borg just doesn't have anything because it's not a problem that Google deals with. Right. What are some of the projects that you find most interesting or some of the interesting innovations and developments are happening? Um, I'm a big fan of the Istio project, Istio. Um, and not just because it partly comes out of Google, but I think the technology is really interesting, really exciting. Um, the, the demonstrations that they can sort of show you, like, look, we can do this for you, um, is on the level of the first demonstrations of Kubernetes, of saying, look, we can do this for you. Right. Um, so it, it sort of gives me that, um, that childlike glee when I see somebody doing something really cool. Um, there are so many other projects uh, I mentioned earlier. The uh, you know networking and devices. There's these all the work around ML and GPUs that is happening. Hmm. I think it's really exciting stuff. That's a really hot space that's going to really change the world and probably obsolete me. Um, and it's exciting to see these people working on things. But you know we got to we got to figure out the sort of principled models with which we're. It working. seems to be a good fit so far with Kubernetes. Yeah, I, it seems I can't imagine it not being a fit. But there's you know, previous decisions that we have to work through uh, in terms of compatibility and in terms of how do we fit these things in the system. Right, right. And then, who do you find some of the most inspiring people around the community? Uh, the most inspiring people, I'm, I'm an engineer through and through, so, uh, you know, I really look up to folks like Clayton, uh, Clayton Coleman from Red Hat, uh, who is really so fundamental to the project. The project would not be what it is without him and his team of, of awesome people that they brought to the project. Mm -hmm. um, but I also look around at some of the people I work with at Google and uh, that, I, that I measure myself against. Uh, There's guys like Brian Grant, who is just a genius, uh, and Eric Toon, who is just the best engineer I've ever worked with. Um, these people are amazing to me. Um, and then you look around the rest of the space, and there's all of these brilliant, exciting people who are out talking about Kubernetes and evangelizing and showing neat ideas. And you know, they don't need to be core contributors to be really exciting. Sure. So, uh, it's it's hard to pick uh, any one. Uh, I tend to be you know I'm picking Absolutely. I guess the people I interact with the most. Um, but uh, there's gonna be quite so a many vibrant community from that. So many people. I'm going to spend all week at KubeCon just talking to people. I mm -hmm. doubt if I will go to a single talk. And then, it, do you have any advice for maybe a, a university student or a young engineer just getting started with Kubernetes? How how do they take that first first step? How do, you, how do you take a first step into any open source project? You, you just start. You just decide you're going to do it. Uh, you decide a problem that you want to try to work on, uh, and you start reading code. Mm -hmm. And Get honestly, clone is the first step. Get clone, exactly. And if you can start from main, and if you can start reading code and comprehending it, and you go an hour and you don't find something you need to fix, you're really not looking hard enough. Yeah, I like it. 
And then finally, a question we, we were asking all of our interviewees here. How did, this is, I have to stifle a little bit of a laugh, how did you get started with Kubernetes? Uh, um, so I was working on the Borg team at Google. Uh, specifically, I was working on the, uh, the Node side of, of the Borg team and, and Omega, um, working on the Node agent. Um, so the equivalent of Kubelet uh, in the Omega side was called Omelet. Um, and uh, we were working on this, and um, we were asked to work more closely with our cloud team to see if we could find ways to synergize, to uh, not duplicate work so much. Um, and at the same time, this Docker thing landed. People started talking about Docker. And we looked at it and said, wow, this is, this is kind of neat. It's sort of what we've got going on inside um, Omelet, Borglet. Um, I could sort of see how this could turn into an open source Borg, which is something that we had sort of pitched uh, to our leadership before, but we didn't really have the momentum behind it. Um, and then a few folks uh, at Google took this and ran with a prototype, and they showed us the, the, this very simple mock-up that they threw together, and it was, it was amazing. It was immediate, like, I see this, I get it, this is, this is something. Um, and so the opportunity to work on this was there, and I said, I would like to help take this from, from prototype into reality. Cool. So. And now I want to eat an omelet. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. Appreciate your time here. Thanks.